It's Andre from the High Performance Academy and we're here at World Time Attack 2015. Now we've got the RP968 behind us which is definitely one of the more impressive cars here uh, at World Time Attack and I've got Dion from En Virage and I wanted to chat to Dion. Dion's responsible for some of the design, the mechanical design of this car. Now before we get into that though Dion, you've got a fairly interesting history as an ex WRC race engineer. So can you tell us how, how do you get involved in WRC at that level? Well. Um my history is I've studied here in Sydney at UNSW, uh, did a mechanical engineering degree. I stayed on and did a PhD in mechanical engineering, understanding structures. I always had a passion for um, motorsport and so I decided to leave Australia and move to Europe. I was fortunate enough to find a job with one of the Citroen Sport satellite teams and so I was then uh, involved in running World Rally cars and Super 1600s all over the world. So in terms of running those WRC cars, what was your actual uh, tasks at rallies? At the rallies, well I managed the car, I dealt with the driver, I, I created the service list for the crew, I created all the setup work for the, for the cars, I, I read the data and so I developed and um, aimed to win the rally with the driver. And one of your areas you were telling me earlier that you were working with was the uh, active center diffs or the active differentials in general in the cars. Now, from a, from a layman, it, it seems like when you're running on a, a surface such as gravel or perhaps ice and snow, that maybe those differentials aren't that critical, but you're telling me they are. How important are they? Well, I mean, you know, the function of a differential is to allow us to create traction, um, especially, you know, while we're turning corners, and it is allowing, in terms of a World Rally car, it's a four-wheel drive. I was fortunate enough to run with, uh, in the period of, uh, three active diffs and then a centre active diff and I, 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 could, I saw the advantages in being able to control the torque distribution fore and aft, the, the torque distribution laterally and uh, these features of differentials not only help us gain traction but also help us control the stability of the car. Uh, those, those changes, are they happening uh, as a function of the driver or is this all automated by an ECU based on the inputs it's receiving? Yeah, so the process as most race cars, we're relying a lot on driver feedback, but then the active part of the differential is all internal to the differential, so there is an ECU or control unit that's feeding in information such as speed, G's, steering angle, uh, brake pressure, acceleration, and then that's sending out signals to a control module, which is usually hydraulic and in some cars electric. And would you, would you change the strategy of that control for a different surface, the likes of perhaps ice and snow versus gravel and then tarmac? Absolutely, absolutely. You're, you're even changing maps over the course of a stage. You know, sometimes you start a stage and it's dry and then, you know, it would become damp and slippery and you'll be changing your differential setting on the fly. Depending on the car, you might have five settings or ten settings. I don't know if you'll be able to actually give us a, a, a number, but just so we can put it in perspective of how much difference that makes, if you could, uh, say, compare a properly set up active differential uh, that's mapped correctly for a stage versus perhaps a, a conventional mechanical differential, what sort of time per kilometre would you, would you expect that active LSD to be worth? It's hard to say the time uh, per kilometre. It's sort of like um, understanding... Uh, whether that's going, to, whether that stage needed that, that influence from the differential, but you're talking about maybe 0.1 or 0.05 seconds per kilometre if you wanted to compare that. But what you would find more so is the longevity in tyre wear, driver confidence, um, and the, to the top speeds. Because mechanical differentials, they tend to produce a lot of friction, and that's their aim. That slows the car down. Active differentials, you can generally open them up on long straights, and so you're picking up a few k's per hour, and that actually reduces the wear and tear on the car. So you're not sort of, you're not always looking at the outright performance as well as the in a long term performance. Let, let's talk about the RP968. So you've been responsible for a, a lot of the mechanical design. Uh, this car's come about over a relatively short period of time. Uh, when faced with a project like this, how exactly do you approach it? Uh, yes, this is quite a big project. As you can see, we've been responsible for a significant part. Uh, my first task is to outline our performance objectives. 
having been uh, involved in Time Attack since 2010, I'm aware, I'm familiar with the tyres and I'm aware of the competition, I'm aware of the domain that we're competing in and so I use that information to help us determine what's our power target, what's our aero target and what's our chassis target and then I would take that information to the relevant people involved, the engine builder, the aero guy and approach them and say this is what we need to achieve you know and so I would then come back with that information that they give me and uh, most often put that into a simulation software compare optimize feedback to them no we need a bit more of this a bit less of that we need to alternate and then I can then use that information that they've given me to create the chassis to create the suspension and integrate it all now, now you just mentioned something that's interesting is the simulation aspect of it and I know that this car was, was basically built in uh, a simulator and you've actually run the car with, with David Wall driving it on the simulator around here. Now, how uh, critical is that in getting all of the parameters dialed in before the car was actually built? Well it's, it's that critical that uh, I would not venture into a task like this without using the simulation software. There is so much to learn that I would, I would always choose that simulation. And so in this circumstance, it's allowed us to understand the influence of the torque curve, the gear ratios, the balance and the balance change, aero balance change over the course of a lap as a function of ride heights. And we can take that information back to help us determine things like our starting boost levels, our starting ride heights, our starting wing angles. So just to focus on one of those aspects you mentioned there that, that probably a lot of people will be able to relate to. So before you ever uh, laid a, a hand or a, a cutting wheel on the, the chassis, before the gearbox was ordered you knew exactly what ratios were going to be needed to do the job based on that simulation on the, on the computer? Yeah exactly and the gear ratios are um, they seem fundamental, they are fundamental, but they seem simple. Um, but when you're talking about cars where the aerodynamics can range from a variation in top speed of maybe 15 or 20 kilometers per hour, and your boost levels being able to range a top speed between 15 and 20 kilometers an hour, we're talking about a speed difference of up to 40 kilometers an hour that we can achieve from a high aero, low power setup to a, a, low, a, a high power, low aero setup. And so having the opportunity to review that window and understand if we will fall into it is critical. So, you know, we can then determine, yes, at that boost level, at that aero, uh, we will not hit the limiter or we can extend our rev limit to know. Now let, let's talk a little bit about the suspension design on the car because that's, you've been instrumental in that as well. How hard is it to design a suspension setup for a car like this with a very high aero downforce in terms of the load on the suspension is going to vary dramatically from low speed to very high speed where that aero downforce comes in? Yeah, that's right. It is it is a challenge. Uh, everyone appreciates the fact that um, these cars have all um, sprung body aero, so the aero applies to the body and which pushes down. So we're often uh, choosing our spring rates, our damping rates, and other aspects of the suspension for the high aero, and we're then having to deal with what that produces at low speed. Uh, the the technology. Um, as far as I see it in terms of optimising the low speed grip comes down to damper technology um, and we, we've got some um, uh, good partners in, that we're involved with which is MCA Suspension, they're doing a great job with us, we give them the information we need, they've come back to us with a product that's doing the job. So when you're, when you're optimising, I guess first of all it's fair to say that any way you look at it there, is got to be, there has got to be some compromise between the performance at low speed and the performance at high speed? Absolutely, there's a compromise, yeah, and so it really comes down to um, the mathematical models that you put first in place, understanding the masses, the, the surface, the tyre that you're using, and then the compromise is then being able to put together the next model, which is the low speed model, how much have we affected our low speed grip. Now when the, the car's actually out there on the track, you know obviously you're fairly early in the, the testing and, and operator, operating phase of this car, what data are you actually looking at to decide on changes to that suspension setup? Well we have, um, primarily we're using our strain, gauge, strain gauges on our shocks. They're reading uh, the exact forces that our shocks are seeing. We convert that to the forces at the contact patch. You need to make a small correction for your roll centers and how they influence the vertical control of the wheel. And we're also looking at the suspension potentiometers. 
Uh, we have uh, two, three accelerometers on the car, and so we're looking at uh, basically how the, the car builds up yaw as a function of its lateral Gs, as a function of its inputs. So I'm looking at all the driver inputs, so throttle, uh, steering angle, brakes. I'm looking at all the inertial outputs, accelerations, yaw rates, and I'm just looking at the basic speeds in certain places. So a range of sensors. When you've got all of that data and you've also got a professional driver giving you input as well, where do you bias your decision making? Do you, do you bias that towards the hard data from the data logger or do you, do you bias it towards your actual input from the driver? Look, I, I tend to trust everyone that I work with. Obviously it's important to trust the driver's feedback. My general approach is to extract the information from the car, have a look at the data, then have a look at the footage. So I might make an opinion looking at the data, um, I'll have a look at the onboard footage and see if it's consistent and then I would approach the driver and get their feedback. Generally the driver will come to you and oftentimes it's on the in-lap that they'll, they'll debrief with you. You'll have 90% of that info before the cars stop. You can take that info on board when you're reviewing data. But you'll always have to come back to the driver because they're driving it. In terms of a, a technology, I guess that's become a little bit more common these days as well as video analysis as well as just the hard data. How, how important is that as another parameter for you when you're reviewing that data? I can say that uh, if I had to choose from here on, if all I had was uh, video footage and data on the car, I would find the video footage would be, help me understand more what the driver is saying. Oftentimes. You, you can read data and you say, well, hold on a second, you backed off on this corner. And with a video, you will notice that there was another car that they were passing. So that obviously is more linked to the driver. And I believe that it will help create a better relationship with the driver by using the video. Just a, a case of really being able to see the, the full picture of what's going on. Look, uh, it's a, an amazing car. Everyone involved has done a, a really impressive job and I'm really interested to see how it goes tomorrow. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with us, Dion. And if people want to get in touch with you and your company, how should they do that? Well, they can visit our website, uh, onvirage.com, uh, or they can uh, contact me at contact at onvirage.com. They can check out what we're doing and I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thanks for chatting and good luck for the weekend. Thanks a lot. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.